Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kurt French. I'm a lecturer within SOMAS. I'm also the director of our Semester by the Sea program. And I'm very pleased to have Eric Bettler joining us uh, today, uh, both at this noon seminar and also at the Southampton seminar this evening, if you know anybody who will be out there at around 730. Um, Dr. Zettler is a professor of, of oceanography, and he's also the associate dean of institutional relations with the Sea Education Association out of Woods Hole. He spent nine years working with Woods Hole, um, the biology department, before moving over to uh, the Sea Education Association, which we'll just call Sea from here going forward, um, in 1994. Um, Eric earned his bachelor's at Allegheny College. Um, he earns his master's at the Autonomous University of Waterloo for my University master's Waterloo in Canada. And then his PhD at the Autonomous University in Madrid. Correct. Um, I met Eric last spring on a colleague cruise with SEA, and uh, we chatted quite a bit. I'm actually an alum of the program that he's going to be talking about, as are a few folks from the audience. Um, so I can talk with anybody about the program afterwards as well. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sir get Eric up here and talk about ocean plastics as well as the SCA program. Thank you very much, Kurt. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, as all of you in the audience know, what scientist doesn't like to talk about their data? And I have a captive audience here. Um, so first of all, the word plastosphere, where did that come from? Um, my wife and collaborator, Dr. Linda Amaral Zettler, who's at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, actually coined that term. We were trying to look for a word that would describe the community that develops around any piece of plastic that's put in an uh, aquatic environment. We're talking mostly about marine, but also happens in freshwater. So this is a poly expanded polystyrene uh, buoy that we found between Woods Hole and Bermuda on a cruise. As you can see, it's got everything from microbes, uh, al macroalgae, uh, barnacles. It's got a whole little community. So just like the biosphere is the thin layer of life on the outside of our planet, we decided that plastosphere would be a good word for the thin layer of life on the outside of any piece of plastic marine debris. And it's kind of a nice topic in that I'm a microbial ecologist, and I've been doing it for 30 years. And really, other than a handful of other microbial ecologists that do what I do, there's not that much broad interest in my work. But let me tell you, once I started working on plastic about 10 years ago, everybody's interested in plastic in the ocean. It's sort of in a visceral way. It impacts all of us. It really makes us concerned about the environment. So it's a nice tie-in to get people talking about science and the environment in general and good use of resources. All right. So this is our view of the Earth. You guys uh, probably know where Woods Hole is. Um, we zoom in. You guys are here. Uh, we're on the elbow of the armpit of Cape Cod, as some people say. Um, and it's a small village. This is what it looks like from the air. But it has a long history of marine science. Um, people tend to think Woods Hole. Well, you, oh, you work in Woods Hole. But Woods Hole is actually quite a number of different organizations. So first there was uh, Marine Fisheries, 1871. Then Marine Biological Laboratory, where my wife works, started in 1888. Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, which perhaps is the best known, I think probably mostly because they found the Titanic. That's sort of when it became a household world, word other than in the science community. And then sort of the new kids on the block, USGS in 1962, where I work, Sea Education Association, 1971, and Woods Hole Research Center in 1985. So it's a tiny little village, but quite a large uh, marine science, marine studies presence. All right, so that's our view of the world, but here's the marine view of the world, and I'm here at the uh, School of um, Marine and Atmospheric Sciences, so I don't have to tell you this, but we know the ocean is important to humans for a lot of reasons. Uh, heat budget, climate, biogeochemistry, including carbon sequestration, natural resources, uh, minerals, food, natural products, and also it is where most of our trade travels across the ocean, and as a subset of that, also where a lot of uh, coastal invasive species are coming from. So it's important from a lot of reasons. I said a lot of people are interested in plastic. And what we're sort of asking is, OK, what are the real threats to marine plastic? Yeah, it's ugly. You don't like seeing it on the beach, the cigarette butts, et cetera, et cetera. But is it really damaging the environment? And I think this is a key question that we have not really addressed. Yes, it's killing marine mammals. Yes, it's killing seabirds. Yes, it's killing sea turtles. But that's all sort of um, emotional. You don't like to see that. But there's not a lot of good evidence. It's starting to come out now 
of how it's actually impacting the ecosystem and population. So that's really where we're trying to get. So you've probably heard of entanglement, ingestion by everything, essentially. Maybe fewer people have heard about as a role of um, transporting toxins, both toxins that are in the plastic and toxins that absorb to the plastic. Invasive species transport, uh, we know that there are a lot of species that move around on plastic. As a microbial ecologist, one thing I'm concerned about is also the transport of potential pathogens, potential disease-causing organisms, and not just for humans, but for marine organisms as well, corals, fin fishes, crustaceans, shellfishes, etc. cetera. Um, and then how that could affect biodiversity in marine food webs and potential food security, especially in aquaculture facilities. Okay, first to correct some misconceptions. Um, this is the media view in a lot of cases. They're getting a little better, but of what the plastic in the ocean the problem is. You see, this is from the San Francisco Chronicle. A mammoth garbage pit in the ocean, you know, twice the size of Texas, deeper than the Golden Gate Bridge. These are pictures you see if you uh, Google um, plastic marine debris, you see things like this, and this, this is a really popular one. That's a river in Manila, has nothing to do with the ocean other than that stuff eventually goes out to the ocean. But this kind of thing just doesn't exist in the ocean. Yeah, there's a lot of plastic in the ocean, but this is the perception. This is the reality. This is what the plastic, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch looks like because we were sailing through it when this picture was taken. So this is the area of the ocean with the highest concentration of plastic on the planet. Looks like basically beautiful, pristine ocean. If you look up really close, this is on the day when we got the largest haul of plastic we ever have in our 30 plus years of towing nets through the water at SEA. If you looked over the side of the boat, yes, you could see occasional little, more than occasional, quite a few little bits and pieces of plastic. But it's not this giant thing you could get out and walk across. If you tow a net over the surface, skim the surface, for two kilometers, one meter wide, so you're filtering 2,000 square meters of the surface of the ocean in the most polluted part on the planet, that's how much plastic you get. That's a lot of plastic, but it's not a giant mountain. Do we occasionally see big things floating by, like a five gallon bucket, or particularly after the tsunami in 2011, um, lots of, you will occasionally get, you know, sort of congregations the size of this room due to local, you know, downwelling or whatever, or, or along fronts, you do occasionally get masses of plastic. But just bear in mind, that is the exception rather than the rule. Most of the plastic in the ocean is dispersed as tiny little pieces. So that's where the microbial ecology comes in. That's really, I think, the community that's being most affected by this. Okay, how can I say that with such authority? Well, these are the two boats that Sea Semester runs. Um, Kurt was just out on this one with me uh, last May. Um, these are 135-foot steel brigantines, custom built for us. Um, they have a professional staff of 10 or 11 and up to 25 students. You can kind of get an idea of the size of the boat. There's a student up in the rigging. You do not have to go up in the rigging for these boats. They are built as sail training vessels, so all the nets, can, or all the nets, all the sails can be handled from deck, but you can go up in the rigging if you earn the right to and you would like to do that. Core with Kramer, she operates in the Atlantic. Robert C. Siemens, she operates in the Pacific. And just sort of as a point of reference, um, these are about the same size as the uh, HMS Beagle that Darwin sailed around the world on. Um, almost the same length, I think that was 90 feet on deck, so probably 130, 140 feet overall, and a little bit narrower than our boat. So our boats carry 35 or 36 people. This boat carried 70 when it went around the world with Darwin, and I think it was about 150 when it was a, a warship on a boat that size. I cannot imagine 150 people on our boat. Um, but something to bear in mind is that not just for undergraduate students for a sea semester program, but also these are ships of opportunity for graduate students, researchers that would like to have samples collected. You'll see later where our boats go. We have sort of big circuits, annual circuits of both oceans, Atlantic and Pacific. So if we're traveling through areas that are of interest to you, and you would like us to collect data, or you'd perhaps like to get out or get a graduate student out on the boat as a visiting scholar, that's something you can do at no charge. Um, it's just basically the boats are going there, we'd like them to be useful as possible. Okay, so the actual program starts in Woods Hole. It's a semester program. 
All of the data, almost all the data I'm being talking about today was actually collected by students. So I'm presenting it. It's part of my ongoing research, part of a National Science Foundation grant. However, a huge part of that is student research, student projects that tie in over many years to these larger projects I'm talking about. So they spend five to seven weeks in Woods Hole learning the basic theory set into the research projects, and then five to seven weeks, well, four if you do the summer program, um, working on the boat. So working the science deck, helping to sail and navigate, occasionally fishing, helping out in the engine room, presenting your data periodically, inter uh, sort of interim reports of your data, and helping to cook. We eat pretty well, sort of like hobbits. We have breakfast, morning snack, lunch, afternoon snack, supper, <laughs> midnight snack. Because there's three watches rotating 24-7, keeping the boat operational. And so you're, believe me, you're always hungry and you don't tend to gain weight. Anyone who's been to sea on any boat knows what I mean. Kind of your life kind of revolves. The watches, you don't really know what day it is, but you damn well know it's an hour till lunch. <laughs> okay. So they look like traditional sailing vessels, but they are outfitted with equipment thanks to National Science Foundation and NASA. So we're able to do, collect good data students can collect good data and do some relatively sophisticated projects, basically smaller version of what's out there on the UNALS research boats. Um, you know, we have a little CTD with 12 Niskin bottles. Um, so we do, um, of course, temperature salinity, uh, oxygen, photosynthetically active radiation, chlorophyll fluorescence, transposometry, and color dissolved organic matter fluorescence. So those are our standard sensors. Uh, we have lots of nets, including this Tucker Trawl opening and closing net. We actually have a little um, mock nest on the Siemens, but it's very difficult for us to actually use it. We can do physical samples, um, sediment grab, a little gravity, as Woods Hole calls this, their suitcase gravity core, because uh, it's a little baby one. But we can get, you know, one, maybe in Carriaco Basin on a good day, two and a half meter core. But um, the students can do geology, physics, ocean uh, biology, ke uh, chemistry projects. So we have a little wet lab. Here's a basic list of the equipment, again, courtesy of NSF. The reason they did that is, one, we teach undergraduates open ocean oceanography, which are pretty rare programs. And also, our boats go year after year to the same places where not a lot of research boats go. So we're contributing our data that the students collect to the National Archives. The first time in my life I've ever, we wrote a proposal for equipment for the new boat. And um, first time in my life, I had a program manager send me back the proposal saying, looks good, add an ADCP. <laughs> oh, OK, if you really want me to, I'll put more money in the budget. Because we were going places that other boats don't go. Uh, we have a small dry lab. This is where we keep the computers, do the analyses. Maximum usually of two to three students at a time in the lab with a, what we call an assistant scientist, usually someone at the master's level. So again, for those of you coming out of master's programs or even undergrads if you have some experience, potential job opportunities. We hire three assistant scientists for each boat that are sailing and standing watch with the students, helping them with their data collection and analysis. Um, despite all that fancy equipment, um, some of our most powerful data sets have come from our simplest samples. This is what we call our Neustad net. So this is a view from up in the rig. Uh, we have it on a boom to get it out of the uh, bow wake of the boat, so hopefully it's sampling clean water. And it's just one meter wide net. We tow it. We adjust its um, height, or the, the amount of line out and the speed of the boat so that it's sort of towing half in and half out of the water. So the new stand is that interface between the air and the water. So anything that floats, you know, jellies, uh, Portuguese man of war, but also trash, plastic, tar balls, uh, sar you know, uh, and anything floating, sargassum, all gets caught. And we've been doing those as part of our standard sampling every day for a long, long time, over 30 years in the Atlantic, going on 20 years in the Pacific now, at noon and midnight, almost every day, conditions permitting. So what are we going for? Well, originally, we're going for biology, right? Some nice midwater fish that come up at night. There's a nice um, viper fish with the jaw, that extensible jaw is pretty cool, mctophids. But of course, most of it is even smaller stuff, the plankton. And as a microbial guy, I always like to point out that they dominate the abundance, biomass, and diversity of the ocean. So yes, whales and turtles and fish are fun, but you know, this is where it's at as far as the ecosystem. Um, of course, we don't just get plankton in those nets. That's what we were originally going for. But more and more, we get little bits and pieces of plastic like that. 
That's sort of a, a typical, that would sort of be a typical amount we would pull out of a new stun net. And that'd actually be a fairly high, if you scale that up, that's probably what, uh, 30 or 40 pieces. So that's probably 20 to 30,000 pieces per square kilometer once you scale it up. So that's relatively, for the open ocean accumulation zones, that's a pretty typical haul. Now again, going back to how can I say with such authority that there's no giant, you know, that what you see in the media is not really what's out there. Um, well, luckily for us, this is the first paper that I know of that reported plastic in the ocean. Carpenter and Smith, 1972. Back then you could get a science paper just by reporting plastic in the ocean. Wouldn't that be great? Um, but they said, we encountered plastic particles in our nets. Currents of these particles on the sea surface has not yet been noted in the literature. So first report. Luckily for us, when Ed Carpenter uh, wrote this, he was at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. So this came out in 72. In 1973, he taught biological oceanography for SEA. And at that time, we were starting to get little bits and pieces of plastic in our nets, occasionally. And he said, you know what, you, should, you know, we were just picking it out and throwing it out. I thought, damn, another piece of plastic. I'm going for the plankton. He said, you know, you should keep track of that plastic. That could be a very interesting story. And luckily, we did. So since then, uh, the first paper that came out from SEA data was in Oceanus in 1987. Uh, Jude Wilbur was one, uh, one of our uh, chief scientists. So he reported on 420 tows on the westward between 84 and 87. Here's the regions that they were towing in. And now, from the first report in 1972, here's 87, just 15 years later, now he's saying it's virtually impossible to tow a new stun net through the surface waters of the Sargasso Sea and not catch plastic debris. So in just 15 years, went from first report in the literature to now you cannot tow a net in these central gyres without getting plastic. So what happened there? Well, here's what we think happened. Um, this is total plastic production global, globally in millions of tons. And here's the years along the bottom. So starting 19, you know, plastic, um, you younger folks think plastic has always been around, but no. It's a relatively recent product. Really, just since World War II has it become a common consumer product. Um, we used to wrap our sandwiches in clay and stone. No, not really. <laughs> but I did wrap them in wax paper. I didn't wrap them in saran wrap. Wax paper, or what we used to call tin foil, aluminum foil. So anyway, first, first report, 1972. At that point, the total global production was only about 30 million only, about 30 million tons per year of plastic. Fifteen years later, Jude Wilbur saying it's almost impossible to tow a net through the Sargasso without getting plastic. Now the global production is up to almost 90 million tons. So over those 15 years, the amount of plastic production tripled. And now we are just, just passing 300 million tons per year of production now. So I think it's just the amount that was going in, um, sort of as a frame of reference, 300 million tons of plastic a year means that for every man, woman, and child on the planet, we're producing about 70 pounds, 35 kilos per day, not per day, per year, per year, sorry, still a lot. So 70 pounds per year for every man, woman, and child on the planet is our annual production. We don't know exactly, but sort of the, rule, the best guess that people come up with is that about 50% of that is for single-use plastic, you know, the top to the coffee cup, the straw, the saran wrap. So that's why we have a plastic problem. We're using a lot of it and we're disposing of a lot of it after one use. Not a very good use of resources. These lines down here are two different models of um, how much of this global production of plastic might be making it into the ocean. Those are just based on sort of theory and meta-analysis. Um, the most recent one is Jenna Jambeck et al. Um, came out in 2015. And they, again, big meta-analysis, taking all the data they could find about plastic getting into the ocean. And they estimate between 4 or, say, 5 and 12 uh, million tons. So pretty much you know, about where these models sit. So we think about that much is getting into the ocean out of the waste stream every year. So since that, we've, been, you know, we've continued sampling. This uh, is showing 30 plus years of Neustadt toes, over 10,000 of them counted piece by piece. Each piece is picked out carefully by a student It's part of their research project or not. It's just general lab duties. And each dot represents one of those 2,000 square meter toes. Um, hotter colors mean more. So these purples mean not very much. So plastic's not everywhere. 
Um, and the red colors, the hotter colors, mean a lot. Up, this goes up to 100,000 pieces per square kilometer. So here's the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, so to speak. Here's the Great Atlantic Garbage Patch, which you may or may not have heard of, but we have one too. We have our own. It's not just the West Coast people. We have our own garbage patch, damn it. Um, this is a little bit dated. This goes to 2012. Now our boats are going uh, in the Pacific, are going as far west as New Zealand, and we're going back across the Atlantic to uh, the Mediterranean, so we'll be able to expand this a little bit, but I don't think the pattern will change much. But So the reason I can say that really there's not this giant patch of plastic out there is because we know. We've, we go out there a lot. We spend 270, 300 days a year at sea, and we're crisscrossing these areas a lot. And so, yeah, there's a lot of plastic in the ocean, but it's small pieces. Okay. How does it get to those areas? Well, for the physical oceanographers in the room, I apologize. It's a very simple model. This is Nikolai Maximenko's uh, circulation model. He's at University of Hawaii. He did a lot of modeling, I think, for the tsunami debris. But essentially, he's seeding the surface of the ocean one time with little pieces of passive drifters. This is based on uh, surface drifters. What would just happen based on wind and ocean circulation? And I'll show you what. It goes over 10 years. Let's see if I can get this to run. OK, so here's the years. So you have your equatorial upwelling. You have your convergence zones, the gyres. And hotter colors, again, mean more. So it'll go to 10, year, 10 years. And then it'll start over to it one more time. OK, upwelling at the equator, accumulation and downwelling at the and So anything that floats is going to accumulate in these five gyres. So this is theoretical, based on a very simple one-time model even distribution, which of course is not real, right? Some river, this plastic does not go in evenly to the ocean. Um, goes in where there's more population, goes in where there's rivers, goes in where there's natural disasters and floods. But the nice thing is we can take this prediction and we can use SCA's student collected empirical data over many, many years to see how it, it um, agrees. So here's SCA's Pacific data, real data. Again, contoured, you know, hotter colors means more. Not much down here, so it fits that pretty well. And here's our Atlantic data. Again, we don't have much going all the way across the Atlantic recently, but fits fairly well. For these, the three southern hemisphere gyres, we don't have as much real data, but there's getting to be more and more, and anecdotal data shows there is also plastic accumulations there. So here's a paper that came out um, for a global estimate in 2014, Cozar et al., Spanish group. The Malaspina expedition, they actually did sail through these southern gyres, only a single transect, but you see it agrees pretty well with the predictions, and they used some of our data here and other people's data. So that was the first estimate. They estimated a total of 10,000 to 40,000 tons in the whole ocean, which when you think about it, it doesn't sound like very much, right? We think that, um, what was it, 10 million tons per year is going into the ocean, but we're only, based on what we sample in our nets, we're only saying 10,000 to 40,000 tons. Um, the same year, Ericsson et al., um, combine that with visual observations of macroplastic, and they came up with an order of magnitude higher, 268,000 tons, but still much lower than you would expect. So the question is, where is all this missing plastic? We think 10 million tons a year is going into the ocean, but our global estimates show only, at least in the surface waters, only 270,000 tons. So where is all it going? Is it sinking? Is it breaking down? Is it getting into pieces so small that our nets don't catch it? Big, important questions we don't have the answer to. So where does it come from? It's illegal, as you probably know, to dump plastic anywhere in the world's ocean. Marine Pollution Act, um, uh, MARPOL regulations prevent it. But it still washes off beaches, comes down rivers and waterways. This is an example of the uh, Los Angeles River in Long Beach, California. After a storm, they have these booms that basically collect it to keep it out of the uh, intakes for uh, power plants and water facilities and stuff like that. But most cities right now don't have any capabilities to actually do anything with that once they capture it. So they just wait for they're not to when they're not drawing water into the plants. And then they just let that stuff go down to the ocean. So a lot of it's getting in. We know that. Of course, catastrophic events like the tsunami or really a big rainstorm anywhere on the coast that has a big river and a, a human population um, you know, washes all that litter that's on the side of the road off the roads and into the rivers and out to sea. Some is still coming. We think about 80% is coming from the ocean, or sorry, from the land. And some still coming from sea, despite the fact it's illegal. We know there's still some illegal dumping. Lost cargo, you know, whole containers 
People have probably heard the story of the Nike shoes and the rubber ducky containers. Well, stuff washes off boats all the time in storms. And some of that sinks, but some of it breaks open and gets into the ocean. Fishing and aquaculture actually contributes a fair amount. Most nets, lines, traps, floats, et cetera now for wild fisheries and aquaculture, that's all synthetic stuff now. So when it gets old or breaks away in a storm or gets lost, that contributes as well. And we have to be honest with ourselves, oceanographic activities. We oceanographers add a small amount of plastic with our instrumentation. I like to think that the benefit outweighs the um, the cost to the ocean, but you know we are putting some plastic in the ocean as well. So that's where it comes from. So what is it about plastic that makes it a problem in the environment? Well, it's properties that make us use it so much. It's light, strong, durable, and cheap. You know, watches, uh, computer widgets, shoes, aerospace, medicine has a lot of great uses that plastic is very suitable for. And I'm not saying we should stop using plastic. We can't stop using plastic really but maybe we should think about how we use it. So the same properties make it a problem being a persistent pollutant in the environment. It's, most of it's lightweight, so it's easily dispersed in seawater, either at the surface or by uh, currents at the bottom. It's strong, so it's hard to break apart. It's durable. It resists biodegradation. That's the whole point, right? You make your lawn chairs, you want them to last. You don't want them to you know, turn into a compost heap after two seasons. And it's so cheap that we essentially consider it disposable. Like I said, 50% of the plastic we manufacture, single-use plastic. You say, well, that's OK. Plastic is recyclable. It's a renewable resource. And in theory, that's true. Uh, a lot of plastics, you know, they have these little symbols on them, so it should be recyclable. The truth is that even here in the United States, where we have a fairly well-developed waste management system, the estimate is that less than 10% of the plastic that could be recycled is recycled. So most of it still goes to landfills, incinerators, etc. So, and that's here where we have a good waste management system. A lot of countries, the developing countries, um, don't have the luxury of that and uh, they are just dumping trash in open dumps still. And so anytime there's a storm, that stuff goes into the environment. So it becomes persistent in the environment. Okay, not all of it floats. I've sort of hinted at this. All the data that I'm presenting is based on the floating plastic. That's all we sample at SEA with our nets. So some, you know, these little codes on the bottom, so polypropylene floats, it's less dense than seawater. Both high density and low density polyethylene float. And polystyrene only if it's expanded, expanded polystyrene foam, styrofoam, so to speak. A lot of plastic is denser than seawater, polystyrene if it's not expanded, PVC, and what most of your drink bottles are made of, polyethylene terephthalate or PET or PETE, it's uh, described as. So all this stuff is sinking. We don't know even less about what's happening to this in the marine environment. We know it's getting there. This is a figure from Barnes et al. 2009. These are pet bottles on the bottom of the Mediterranean, at the uh, bottom of one of the canyons where it's washed down to the deep uh, Mediterranean. These are from above the Arctic Circle. These are up in polar seas. So the stuff's making it everywhere to the bottom. It's not just and so, and we have even less, it's harder to study, we have even less idea about how much plastic is on the bottom, where it is, what it's doing. Again, on the bottom, this is a meta-analysis, Duodero and Alomar 2015. This came out last year, showing based on trawls in the Mediterranean, um, the percent of the debris that they brought up, the human-based stuff that was plastic. So this is 76 to 100 percent. You see a lot of the marine debris in all these areas was plastic, and then this figure is showing up. They, they counted 134 species that were associated with the plastic, either attached to it or ingested it, and it ranged from algae, fish, invertebrates, marine mammals, sea turtles, seagrass. So really, almost every major group of organisms, marine organisms, is somehow interacting with plastic. The question is, is that a neutral interaction? Is that a negative interaction? Is it, is it good? It's more substrate, so you can grow more of them? That's what we don't really know yet. My personal favorite. Plastisphere Ken. He's almost local. He has, this was brought up by a scallop fisherman in um, Block Island Sound um, from about 30 meters down, I believe. Um, you can see he's got some nice uh, uh, bryozoan or hydroid uh, hair, little mohawk there. He's got some sponge, uh, a sponge g-string and um, <laughs> some barnacles. 
We might, most plastic you can't date. We might be able to date this Ken by the hairstyle. We could probably figure out, does anyone recognize have this particular Ken? <laughs> but so it, it's getting down there and it is becoming part of the substrate. Okay, so moving beyond just counting it, which is what we've all been doing for a long time now. As I said, what is it actually doing? What's the science of plastic marine debris? That, okay, what kind of plastics out there? You know, are certain resins more um, persistent? Are certain resins of more concern? Are certain resins, um, you know, are the, could we use different resins and decrease the problem? What are the ecological implications? Who are the members of this new ecosystem, the plastosphere? Is it transporting invasive species? We know it's transporting invasive species, but is it actually causing invasions of non-indigenous species and various? We don't know that. There's no documented cases that I know about. And as a microbiologist, I'm interested, is biodegradation a sink for marine plastic? We know that microbes, bacteria, and fungi can degrade a lot of plastic resins, including polyethylene at a very low rate, on land in commercial composting facilities where it's high temperature, high nutrients. Um, those aren't the conditions in the open ocean. It's compared to a, land, or a composting heap, even the tropical ocean is cold, low nutrient, high UV. So we don't really know what's happening there. I'll show you a little evidence. We think there's some biodegradation going on. I don't think it's an important sink, but I think it's happening. All right. How's it affecting food chains? So Selnrich, this is a journalist in 2015, came out with this, uh, is plastic a new link in the food chain? Um, and how does that affect seafood safety? Well, from our own, this is SEA data, um, just anecdotal trigger fish we found uh, underneath the five gallon bucket out in the middle of the ocean, so using that as a shelter. Uh, its gut had about 30 pieces of plastic in it. This is a uh, mahi mahi from the Pacific, had this piece of um, plastic mesh in its stomach, uh, not the chapstick, that's just for scale. Uh, it wasn't like doing its lips and swallowed it by accident. They are fast swimmers. Uh, but not just us. Basically, everywhere we look now, things are ingesting plastic. This is a uh, paper that came out last year, copepods in the Pacific. This is a 2010 paper, uh, necropsies of two sperm whales, I think also on the West Coast, I can't remember off the top of my head, um, that had between them, I think, 150 kilos of synthetic fishing net in their stomachs. There's no guarantee that's what killed them, but it probably didn't help them. So we know the stuff's eating. So they're eating it, yes. We also know plastic has toxins in it. It has PVC itself, it's toxic. It has uh, BPA, um, bisphenol A, which is used in manufactured plastics, can be toxic. Plasticizers, things they add to plastic to make it more flexible, less flexible, more transparent, less transparent, pigmented, make it fireproof, make it fungi-proof. All these additives can leach out of the plastic and then in addition, plastic is a hydrophobic surface. And what that means is it's going to absorb a lot of these legacy, sort of the ones that normally go into your lipids in your body, also will absorb onto plastic. Things like DDT, PCDs, PHA. So it has toxins in it to begin with. It absorbs toxins from the ocean. And if you think about it for a second, I said that we think most of the plastic in the ocean comes from land. That means it's traveling down rivers through our coastal waters. So it's going through the most polluted waters on our planet, the place where we put our sewage, where we put our industrial waste, potentially absorbing some of the toxins from that area. Then within, based on drifter studies, I think within two to three months, those particles can be out in the middle of the North Atlantic gyre in relatively ligotrophic, relatively pristine water. Now the equilibrium is gonna change and that stuff's gonna start coming off the plastic. So is that impacting the ecosystem? Again, we don't know. We just know things are eating it. Uh, a couple studies on mctophids have shown that about 10% of mctophids that were looked at had plastic in their gut. And we know a lot of other fish are eating it as well. And these are food species. So if you think about, is it starting to bioaccumulate? Again, not much is known. We do know that plastic occurs at lots of different sizes in the ocean. These are little microplastic particles, 500 micrometers. These are the SCA sort of confetti sized ones that we typically get. And this is a ghost net. Again, we picked up between Bermuda and Woods Hole, big piece of plastic. So these plastics can enter the food chain really at any, or food web at any level. There's the mctophids, so they're eating this size, but then you know they're getting eaten by squids. And so is that stuff moving up the food chain into things that we like to eat, you know, like marlin and tuna, and et cetera? Again, we don't know the answers to these questions. There's some experimental work that's been done in labs. 
it's unclear how well that translates into actual environmental toxin loads. For instance, even if you find toxins in something, a fish or a bird at sea, how do you know it got that from the plastic in its gut? It might have got it from you know, eating things that were in contaminated water or through its gills. So it's hard to partition where that uh, contamination actually comes from. But it's certainly an active area of concern with people that are studying these problems. OK. Invasive species. It also transports invasive species. We know that. This is a relatively old paper, 2003. But this is showing harmful algal bloom species attached to drifting plastic in the Mediterranean, so potentially moving harmful algal bloom species around the basin. This is a little buoy. You see the size of the fingers that we picked up in the Pacific. Despite how small it was, it has all these barnacles. It even has a little crab on it. This is one of the docks that we know came from Japan that washed ashore on the west coast of the US, uh, six, two, 20 meters long. And these are people basically um, burning off all the attached organisms to try to um, prevent any invasive species from establishing themselves. Um, this was from our Pacific cruise, and specific, uh, especially for plastic research in the Pacific in 2012. And the first paper just came out from that by uh, Mike Gill and Joe Fowler down in Florida. Look, he, Mike was on the trip, and they found that the barnacles actually are sort of like the first colonizers that then make it easier for other things to attach. So they found a nice correlation between when barnacles were on there or not. So I said, any floating object attracts and concentrates organisms in the ocean, fishing fads, fishing aggregation devices. Fishermen know this. You put something in the water, things gather around it. It increases nutrients. It increases biomass by just serving as a substrate. But if you bring this on board, which we did, and you look at it more carefully, it has all kinds of stuff growing on it, including, which was very interesting to me, these guys here. These are called either sargassum crab or Columbus crab. They were described by Columbus, Columbus in 1492 in his log. You see their coloration. They're really adapted to be on sargassum, that brown floating algae in the Atlantic. And that's their typical habitat. But now they're jumping onto plastic. So how does that affect their populations, their distributions? Well, you say, well, who cares? You know, Stuff has been floating around the ocean for a long time. It has, but plastic is different. Plastic lasts a lot longer. We don't really know how long it lasts in the ocean. When we get a piece of plastic out of the ocean, we don't know whether it's been there three weeks, three months, three years, potentially 30 years. These are, again, from SEA net toes. So here's the sargassum density in those nets. Hotter colors mean more. right? This has a life cycle. Some of it comes out of the Gulf of Mexico. And then it dies and settles eventually and starts the cycle again. Plastic from the exact same net toes, you see as we headed east here, it didn't start dropping out. So if you're attaching to plastic, you used to attach to sargassum, you're not going to get very far east. But now if you're attaching to plastic, you can conceivably move around whole ocean basins, successive generations of organisms. So it's potential for moving things a lot further than natural substrates. Even things like pumice and wood eventually get waterlogged and sink. OK, so very simple studies at first. Again, trying to understand the science, not just count the pieces how big are the typical pieces? This was a, an alumna, Sky Marie Ferguson, got this published in 2010. Just taking about 750 SEA samples, we save all the plastic that we get in our net. So we have an archive going back 28 years now, I think, of samples we've taken out. She just took a latitudinal gradient in the Atlantic and measured the size with calibers and the weight with an um, analytical balance. You can see most pieces are quite small, three millimeters or less. And most pieces are quite light. That's about the weight of a standard staple. So most pieces, yes, big pieces are out there. Most pieces are small and lightweight. What about what kind of plastic is out there? Well, we, got it. we now have a little Raman spectrometer that we can take out on the boat. Uh, it's a microscope-based one, so we can look at small pieces. And that just uses a laser. It interacts with the uh, bonds in the plastic. And you get a basically a fingerprint. We can look at reference pieces. We know that's polypropylene. We know that's polyethylene. Then we can take samples from our net. Students can and see the computer can match up where the peaks occur and say, well, that's a 95% match to polypropylene, you know, a 98% match to polyethylene. So we can identify a lot of the resins, not all of them with Raman. Um, but at least it's a first step figuring out what's out there. From our data, it looks like 70 to 80% of what we get in our nets is polyethylene. 
This corresponds with what other people have published. So the question is, does that mean 75 to 80% of plastic that is used for consumer products is polyethylene? Does that mean 75, 70 to 80% is, gets into the ocean? Does that mean it lasts longer? Does that mean polypropylene sinks faster? Again, these are basic questions we don't know the answer to, but we can start to tease them apart if we know what's out there. So the latest project that I'm going to finish up with is the microbial one. And this is a uh, collaborative project with SCA, me at SCA, my wife, Linda Amarazel, at Marine Biological Laboratory, Tracy Mincer, who's at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, a ge uh, biochemist, and a lot of SCA students that have helped with this work, because almost all of our samples um, are based on, or almost all our work is based on student samples. So we're using a combination of imaging, both scanning electron microscopy and confocal imaging, high throughput sequencing at MBL, and culture work to try to tease apart this population. So in our first paper in 2013, um, we just started looking at images. And um, you know, we have primary producers like this diatom, the cyanobacteria. You have bacteria on the surface, filamentous things. Predators, this is a suctorian. It's a ciliate that swims around as a juvenile and then attaches, so single cell protist. And then it uses these tentacles and grabs other protists and sucks the protoplasm out of them. You zoom, zoom in on its surface, it has these bacterial epibionts. We're not sure what they are, but we think they have something to do with sulfur cycling. So it's, we don't think it's just an epibiont. We think there's some sort of symbiosis going on there. And then most intriguingly to us for these things, we're calling pit formers. These are two, sorry, this is a 10 micrometer scale bar in each figure. These are two to four micrometer little spheres that appear, that occur in these fields, and they appear to be embedded in the surface of the plastic. So we think that they are somehow, we're not saying they're biodegrading it. They might not be me metabolizing the plastic, the carbon. But at least physically, they appear to be, you know, maybe something to do with attachment. They are physically breaking it down. We haven't been able to isolate these, so we don't have a smoking gun. We do have molecular data that confirms there are quite a few known hydrocarbon degraders that we find on plastic, but we haven't put two and two together yet. So that's really something we're interested in. So this is why I think that plastic is being broken down, biodegraded, probably in the ocean. I don't think it's a significant sink, but I think it's still interesting to figure out what those things are. So looking at the molecular data, the DNA, um, this is based on three polypropylene samples. This is using old, uh, older technology, pyrotag sequencing, polypropylene, three polypropylene samples, three polyethylene samples, three seawater samples, all from the same sites. So we take a net. We take out a piece of polypropylene, a piece of polyethylene, and filter seawater there and look at what's there. So this is the number of tags that we sequenced for each one. And then this is the number of operational taxonomic units or species equivalents, if you will. So no real um, surprise here that what's attached to surfaces is very different from what's in the seawater. But we were curious to see that while there's a shared core of attached species on both kinds of plastic. Remember, this is based on triplicate samples, not just a single random sample. There are also significant numbers of <coughs> organisms that only occurred on polypropylene and a significant number that only occurred on polyethylene. So is there some sort of selective, are they sort of selective media? Do different things draw different resins? If so, that has policy and biodegradation implications. So if you look at that a little more carefully, again, here's those three seawater samples three polyethylene, three polypropylene. The colors just mean different species. Just consider each color as a species. The, the pattern here is all I want you to see. Even though these are different years, that's Cruise 230, that's in 2012, 241 was in 20, sorry, 2010, 2012. Two years apart, different parts of the ocean. You still have the same major players in the seawater, in the Atlantic, wherever we went. But the plastic, even though it clustered together in the, in the Venn diagram here, if you look at it carefully, they're very different, so it's a much more um, heterogeneous um, community. It seems to vary a lot who's growing on the plastic. So that was based on just six plastic samples. Since then, we've done over 100. We did a long transit in the Atlantic, long transit in the Pacific. See similar patterns, but now we have more data, so we can start looking at things like biogeography. This is just a, a principal components analysis, so basically the closer two points are together, the more similar their communities. This is look at the, looking at the whole bacterial community. How similar are they in this ordination space? How close together are they? 
So ones that are far apart have very different communities. Ones that are close together have very similar communities. This kind of surprised us in that we can distinguish Pacific from Atlantic communities. So even though the environment's more or less the same, plastic resins, open ocean oligotrophic waters, plastic resins, open ocean oligotrophic waters, something is different that's making those microbial communities be different. Why does that matter? Well, from a policy perspective, that means one size doesn't fit all for how you address this problem. Things are behaving differently depending on what area of the ocean you're in. Finally, um, one of our samples kind of jumped out at us. This is um, the number, the percent of the little snippets of DNA from a sample that are in these various bacterial groups. This one jumped out at us. On this sample, a quarter, 25% of the pieces of DNA were from a Vibrio species. Now, Vibrio, it's a natural marine bacterium, lots of different kinds, lots of more harmless. They're both attached and free living. But a lot of them also can cause diseases or be, be opportunistic pathogens. Vibrio cholera causes cholera. Vibrio parahemolyticus can make you very sick if you eat contaminated shellfish. Vibrio alginolyticus can be an opportunistic pathogen. If you get in a wound, it can cause the muscle wasting problem. So, you know, there's a lot of sort of urban legends out there. Oh, seawater is good for cuts. Just wash it out with seawater. You never wash out a cut with seawater. That's probably the worst thing in the world you can do. There's a bazillion different nasty little guys in there. So we wanted to look at this more carefully. Why do we care? Um, not just human disease, but as I said, aquaculture is a big deal. And one of the main causes of loss in aquaculture is uh, microbial diseases. This is not a Vibrio, but another bacterial disease. You know, that's, the flesh might be fine, but that's not a very marketable salmon. Um, so it has some real life um, implications. And this is from uh, FAO 2014 fisheries report. Aquaculture, this is total fisheries caught in these different years. The, the light blue, that's wild caught fisheries. And the dark blue, that's aquaculture. So you can see it's almost 50% of our seafood now comes from aquaculture. And it's, it's thought that within the next five to 10 years, cultured seafood will outpace wild caught seafood. So the possibility of avoiding disease in aquaculture is a real important thing. So simple students, students can do. We can use selective media take pieces of plastic, take pieces of algae, take seawater, and just try to grow different kinds of vibrio and see what they can see. So again, this is a student project. Using this, this media will only grow vibrio and other things that can take bile salts. We don't know what these vibrio are at this stage. This is out on the boat. But we can tell they're very different. You can just count colonies and do colony morphology. That's surface water, deep water, 550 meters, so very different vibrio communities there. And this one was a little more surprising. Both things that float at the surface, sargassum and plastic, but you see what's growing on plastic is very different, again, from the same net. So somehow that plastic is being a selective medium for certain microbes. If we take that back to the lab, this is Ben Ong from Rice University who came back and did an internship. He isolated a bunch of those. We have over 400 vibrio cultures now and other bacteria. And he used some very simple experiments. This is sheep's blood auger, and if you streak them on it, some vibrio will lyse the blood cells. So they have hemolytic capabilities. Doesn't mean they're necessarily pathogenic, but probably not something you want to get inside you. <coughs> so um, then we've also done some sequencing, 16S ribosolar RNA, and this heat shock protein 60, which is good for distinguishing between vibrios. We're starting some full genome sequencing and adherence experiments, which I'll just finish off with. So looking at this HSP60, so this is a gene that's supposed to be good for distinguishing between Vibrio. Martin Poltz up at MIT and his group have done a lot of, published a lot of uh, molecular work on Vibrio that have been isolated from the coast. So we, these are our open ocean samples. Um, the shape tells you whether it was isolated from seawater off of a piece of sargassum, that brown algae, or off a piece of plastic. It's so open ocean, and then we had a student, a master's student, come and look at just plastic on the beaches in Woods Hole. So it turns out these ones from the beaches are very similar to what Martin Poltz's group had published. But they're very, they don't cluster at all together with the ones we're getting in the open ocean, which is mostly this Vibrio harvii group, Vibrio alginolyticus. That's the one I told you can be a potential pathogen. So we're not sure why, but um, the stuff that's sticking to surfaces in the open ocean seems very different. And be curious to find out, does that stuff move around the ocean? Does it come into coastal areas? All right. We're also interested in how these vibrio attach to plastic. So we can, now that we have cultures, we can do experiments. Again, another 
uh, internship. This is um, Amy, I'm forgetting her last name, I apologize, another student, uh, looked at different resins and different cultures of Vibrio. So this is after six hours on polypropylene, two different cultures of Vibrio that were both isolated from plastic in the ocean. But at this point, we didn't have the Raman specs, so we didn't know what kind of plastic they were isolated from. It was very interesting that after six hours, this one is attached like crazy to plastic, to the polypropylene. But after six hours, this one has not even started attaching to polypropylene. So the implication is this guy was on some other piece of plastic. Again, evidence that different kinds of surfaces and resins are attracting different communities and might have different um, impacts on, on uh, ecosystems. So we have no idea, as I said, when we get a piece of plastic from the ocean, has it been out there a week, a month, a year, 10 years? So we're doing some very simple experiments in Woods Hole and with colleagues down in Grenada, just putting polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, and glass beads as sort of a control or just a, a non-plastic surface, but an artificial surface. And very simple, we put them in, ca you know, put them in cages so crabs and fish can't get at them. We hang them off the dock and we sample them periodically for both scanning electron microscopy, Kira Saleem from North Carolina Central University, Jessica uh, from Brown University, Jeremy Pivor from uh, Washington University of St. Louis, doing molecular work and SEM, and look at that over time. So here's just an example, polyethylene, in which whole time zero, scanning electron micro 60 micrometers. Um, that's a scratch from my forcep, that's nothing, that's just a scratch. But after one week, I uh, have this lawn of penate diatoms. After two weeks, you still have the diatoms, but you're getting more diversity in there. Some of the diatoms have disappeared. After a month, again, even more diversity. After two months, you start to get the three-dimensional structures in the biofilm coming up off the surface. And after four months, which is as far as we've gone so far, you're starting to get cracks in the plastic and this really complex uh, three-dimensional reef, microbial reef is what my colleague calls it. So it's a very complicated surface once you get down to this scale. And we think things might be eating plastic at ocean. You know, why do birds and fish and things that are selective feeders, why are they eating plastic? Well, if, it, if it's coated like this, it probably tastes and smells good. It tastes and smells like an organic particle. This is just the same experiment, but using the molecular data to show these are triplicate molecular samples. Um, Duplicate, duplicate. So the diatom chloroplast, you see lots in the beginning, taper off, so it corresponds to what we're seeing on the SEM. Rhodobacteriaceae are common biofilm formers. They're consistent throughout. Cyanobacteria are the yellow and orange, so that changes. The yellow ones get far less abundant, the orange ones get far more abundant. So basically, this community is evolving. And I think I'm going to skip that because that's pretty detailed and we're running low on time. Basically, that's just more detail, the same how things change over time. There's succession, sort of like in a field, you know, going from a bare field to hardwoods, but here it happens over a period of weeks with microbes instead of over months, or over, over years rather. Okay, finally, uh, this is very complicated data, the molecular data. We've started to try to do a little bit of network analysis where we look at just associations between species. We're trying to figure out who occurs with who and what the interactions there might be. So we're looking at pairwise comparisons with really high Pearson correlation codes. So basically, they have to occur together almost all the time for us to call them associated for this particular analysis. We looked at a lot of sequences, 600 eukaryote to eukaryote associations and 5,000 eukaryote to bacterial associations. Don't let your eyes glaze over on this next figure. We're going to make some sense of it. This is a tiny, this is like a 50th of the network analysis, the first one we did. Yellow is eukaryotes, blue is bacteria. Let's just start to tease some things apart. Looking at the eukaryotes, we have predators, ciliates, uh, vorticella, amoeba, coenoflagellates. We have um, primary producers, dinoflagellates, diatoms, rotophytes. We have parasites, cryptosporidium. We have groups of eukaryotes associated with groups of bacteria. We have some Look what look like predator-prey relationships. These are all predators, eukaryotic predators. Looks like they are always associated with these bacteria, so they're, they like to munch on them, it looks like. We have single eukaryotes associated with lots of bacteria, so maybe that's the microbiome of that copepod. 
And that kind of jumped out at us. Why are we getting copepods on a piece of plastic? We rinse them really carefully with filtered seawater because we only want things that are attached. Why are we getting this copepod? Well, we thought maybe it has something with these hydroids because we know that they can eat copepods. So we decided to look at something we knew was attached, the hydroids. We know it's attached because we have SEMs. This is one of our pieces of plastic. So there's the, uh, the hydroriza, the stock, and then this hydrotheca that, that um, protects the little, little organism. This is a uh, picture from Heckel of the same species. So we know these are attached. Let's look at what they're associated with. Well, they have very strong associations with two paratrix ciliates and with that copepod. So we're thinking, hmm, maybe the paratrix ciliates are attached. So n normally paratrix ciliates are often attached to the surface. Maybe they're attached close to this. But another possible explanation is based on this paper from uh, 1996 by Larry Maiden et al. They basically, they saw this bloom of hydroids on George's bank. And it basically turned out it was eating 50% of the copepod production per day, this bloom of hydroids. So we said, ah, well, if the hydroid is eating the copepod, and we know paratrixilates also like to attach to copepods, that's another potential explanation. So these are the kind of things we're trying to tease apart of what's actually happening in that plastosphere community. In the future, we're starting to do genomics, so look at whole genome sequences of vibrios and other things, and metagenomics, uh, this work that Linda's working on. She'll be presenting some of this work down at the Ocean Science Meeting this, later this month, early next month. Um, so that's where we're going with this, and here's the conclusions. Basically, marine debris is quickly colonized by lots of things. So those experiments we did off the docks. Cells are colonizing those, that plastic within the first 30 minutes, bacteria and diatoms, really fast. They, there's complex interactions between bacteria, protists, and animals. It's different from what's in the surrounding water. It's different from what's on natural substrates, and it's different regionally. And we don't know how it's impacting open ocean food webs. So I'll stop there with thanks to the people who really did the work, uh, over 8,000 alumni who picked all that plastic, including Hal and Kurt, and I know there's one, at least one of their alumnus in the audience, all contributed to this work, Central Microscope Facility, and my collaborators on the Plastisphere Project, the uh, Microbial Project, Linda and Tracy. And that, with that, I will take questions. Yes? This is nothing to do with microbes, but with the data you are collecting, I noticed you're not collecting PAH. Why? I would expect it for a long term kind of. PAH? Yes. Uh, well, one thing is I think pH is denser than seawater, so it sinks. We wouldn't collect it in our nets. We are doing some experiments. PH. 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 Oh, PH. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, we do some work with pH for, uh, but. Right now, the meters are not really good enough to give us the level, so we do it colorimetrically. We use a brome creosol purple uh, colorimetric method, and we can calculate pH that way. But it's a, that would be part of a special student project. But we haven't looked at how that compares to my commu the plastosphere community, if that's what you're asking. Yeah. Yes? Is there any evidence to suggest the toxicity of the plastics can select for microbial colonization? That's a great question. That's something we'd, like, we'd love to follow up on that. That's a really good question. And are the microbes um, transforming the toxins in the plastic? Are they making it less available, more available? Are they affecting the microbes that grow in the plastic? These, yeah, I mean, you, there's all these really good and what seem like obvious questions that people, we just don't know. This is really a pretty new field. Really only in the last 10 years have people been looking at sort of the science part of plastic in the ocean. Great question. Yes. First, a sampling issue. Now, the ocean is full of oceanic fronts. Mm -hmm. They have properties of sweeping up and converging objects, and often, and then tracks the whole ecosystem as well. And, they, mm -hmm. and the concentration of contaminants can be 2,000 times background. So, if you're just going out in the ocean sampling on a regular routine, you might miss a lot of, a lot of these frontal areas which would have very high concentration. Mm -hmm. So, that's just a comment. Mm -hmm. The other thing is about the, our, the economic system we live in. Yeah. The responsibility of the manufacturer of, say, Coca-Cola and when that plastic bottle of Coke leaves the factory, yep. they don't want to know about what happens after that. So who's responsible?
responsible for this, and that so the price of disposal, recycling, and damage to the environment is not included in the, in the price of 7 Eleven. Absolutely not. And, it, and maybe it should be, but it'll take a political revolution to yeah. change that. Yeah, they're passing it on to all of us. They're passing it on to us and everyone else who and the fish. And the fish. Um, yeah, to the first question about fronts, absolutely. Um, we don't tend to see a lot of those fronts in the um, central gyres where we are. We do see and sample across a lot of um, um, yes. What are they? What's the proper Langmuir? Thank you, Langmuir lines. We see those all the time, of course, and so. When we do see those, our standard method is to make sure that our track, tow track goes across those to try to not get all windrow tow, which means, like you said, it's going to be 10,000 times the background, and not all clean water, which means you're not going to see anything. So yeah, it is a, it, our sampling is certainly not perfect. All I can say about our sampling is it's very consistent. And people have said, why are you still using that old Neustan nets? Now there's the Manta trawls, which are more effective and more efficient. We're still, we made a conscious decision because we have 30 years of data from that and we don't want to change. We want our data to at least be internally consistent. Yeah. Yes? Um, it doesn't have to do anything with, um, with the microbes but from the conservation side. What do you think about the ocean cleanup? Is that a viable solution or is it more like a very expensive scam? The ocean cleanup as in the, the giant, yeah. uh, the, the young gentleman in yeah. Holland? Um, I've been asked that on camera multiple times and I think he is a. Uh, no, it could be on record. He's a clever young man. I'm glad people are thinking about it. Um, me and every other oceanographer I know uh, doesn't really think it's a practical, workable solution. I would love to be proved wrong. I think the place to clean it up is at beaches where it's concentrated, reefs, rivers, before it gets in the ocean. I think the best way to clean up the ocean is to stop putting plastic in it, and the ocean will clean itself up. And if we got rid of or reduce single-use plastics, we would have the amount of plastic we're putting in the environment and maybe give ourselves another 10 or 20 years to figure out a better solution. Yes? So you showed the uh, results of uh, culturing on Vibrio, comparative analysis mm -hmm. of different Vibrio cultures. Uh, what about the molecular analysis of sargassum communities compared to the, uh, the plastic? Yeah, it's a, that's the that's what we're trying to do right now. When we first, part of the proposal was to look at on plastic versus natural substrate sargassum feathers. With we have lots of sargassum samples. We're just now, after three years, figured out how to get the um, epiphytes off of the sargassum without being totally flooded with sargassum DNA. So that's been our challenge. But yeah, that's the we have some preliminary data that shows it is indeed different from what, there's overlap with sargassum, but it's different from what's on sargassum. As you probably know, sargassum and a lot of other algae have, make a lot of antimicrobial compounds. They don't want stuff growing on them. And so it's going to be a different community than plastic. But yeah, that's an obvious question. Thank you. You know, 12 months after Edward Carpenter wrote those papers and went on that the DA cruise, he began a 20-year career. Oh, I didn't know it. it was here for a long time? Because he's out at San Francisco now, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, we, uh, we thank uh, Ed all the time. for I'm, I have been in contact with him out there because he's had graduate students. He's gotten back into plastic again after like a 20-year hiatus. Yeah. No, I didn't realize that. I, s I, I have one more question, which is that our comment, really, is that uh, so it, it's very typical for people to argue that diversity in and of itself is a very positive mm -hmm. characteristic if to try to attain. And so you just presented an analysis that showed that plastic enhances diversity compared mm -hmm. to seawater. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering how you would argue if someone said, uh, a regulator said, well, look, you just showed that the diversity is enhanced, but it's why why you want to get rid of it? We should be adding more. Yeah, I should probably have a better elevator answer for that because that's a, another common and good question. I think it's because what we're doing is we're introducing weeds into perhaps sensitive environments like the Sargasso Sea, which has already its own endemic community. And so just introducing more, you know, just scattering dandelion seeds on a lawn doesn't necessarily make it better. Um, and also the potential of pathogens that could impact. So you're right, it's increasing the diversity. I guess I'm, I'd have to say I'm not really of the vein that every increase of species is good for the planet in a particular region. 
just want to see. There was a question in the back. <laughs> Actually, yeah, uh, most of the sampling effort seems to be on rather small, uh, bigger size plastic, taken from a cellular standpoint, while toxicity may be higher on smaller particles that can be intracellular, including for pathogen, as a matter of fact. The, the, the very small pieces? Yes. And what the available data and whether there is effort to uh, yeah. assess that, whether in terms of toxicity, abundance, mm -hmm. stability, whatever. There are people that are starting to look at the, the nanoparticles yeah. of plastic and also the yeah. ones that have plastic and other compounds. Right. Um, we don't do that work ourselves. We don't have the capacity for it. But that's sort of right now I'm part of a, a UNEP workshop to look at what the direction of plastic research, marine debris research should be. And that's uh, high on the list of priorities is, yeah, all we know about is the big stuff. Yeah. And it might be the tip of the iceberg as part of what's actually biologically uh, meaningful. Yeah. Yes, Kurt. Just to kind of pull together a couple of the comments in terms of regulators' frustration with the manufacturers and small plastic pieces, um, can you talk a little bit about micro beads and uh, even following the national policy? Well, the legislation, is, I mean, that's a. Oh, so micro beads are, well, it depends who you ask. Uh, a lot of people say less than 500 micrometer, some people say less than 100 micrometer. Very small particles of plastic, like the ones I showed in that food web, the ones at the bottom. They're used in a variety of applications. Um, a lot of personal care products, exfoliants, uh, like they're little abrasives. They use them with um, uh, basically um, sandblasting, so to speak, small uh, sensitive things like electronics components. And so they're really tiny. There's a gazillion of them. They, as far as we know, they get through sewage treatment plants. Uh, we know that they occur more densely near human populations. We have no idea. So we know they're accumulating out there. We have no idea what they do, which the gentleman in the back was pointing out. Those are the particles that are more abundant. We have no idea how they're interacting with the biosphere. The good thing is, is actually, it's, I'm shocked that the US just banned. Now remember, they only banned them in personal care products. So in, industry is still allowed to use them. So they'll still be out there, but it's a huge first step. Yeah. So there is, there is lunch, and um, because we have lots of other things going on today, and we should wrap up and, and thank you. You can continue the discussion. Thanks for your attention. Do you ever take students out there that would like to collect aerosols? Sure, yeah. We